Hey everybody, I'm Benjamin, aka The Terrible Australian of SuperMarcy.com and welcome to the 10th edition of my 2015 Myth Video Reviews. Uh, for this one, I will be reviewing the documentary Listen to Me Marlin, and as well as the horror thriller The Invitation. So, let's get right into it. Uh, as I stated in previous videos, and I'll state again for those who, uh, who haven't watched them, that I'll be reading the synopsis for both these films from this year's Myth program, so that way I don't screw them up. So... Which I do have a habit of doing, but you know, that's a whole different story. So, uh, so let's get right into it. Now, first up, of course, listen to me, Marlon. Marlon Brando was one of Hollywood's greatest actors, a performer who masterfully channeled his inner conflict into roles as diverse as on the waterfront's hapless dock worker to the sexual nihilist of Last Tango in Paris. He was also a compulsive diarist who spent decades capturing his thoughts on audio tape building a substantial archive that has, until now, remained publicly unavailable. Now, what makes this documentary sort of different from, say, other documentaries about celebrities is this one, which is directed by uh, Stevan Riley, who also made the documentary Fire in the Babylon. Um, what makes this one different from other bio documentaries is this documentary it uh the main subject of this documentary is Marlon Brando he, um we kind of know the life of Marlon Brando from the man himself since um as it says in the synopsis he has kept uh sort of recorded diaries throughout his entire life and so the basis of this documentary is that they kind of from those recordings they kind of give us an insight into the man himself and what from his past and his family and the way how he approaches his roles and and that way it kind of gives and which kind of makes it at the same very refreshing as a documentary because usually documentaries like this you get a lot of sort of um you know different interviewees and all that who kind of talk about uh the person but to hear it from you know the life story from the person from the man himself kind of adds sort of an intimate feeling to it so that makes it more personal as a documentary and it's actually really really interesting and not just record and um a lot of the, sort of the recordings are not just from Marlon Brando's diaries we also get some archival footage from past interviews and tv appearances and whatnot so they, so the director behind the start Stephen Wright Stephen Riley uh definitely has a vast catalogue of recordings to use for this documentary and I have to say and I have to say I thought he did a really good job with this one I thought it just like I said it just gave us a really good insight in the man himself and to hear it from his own words was interesting and because you know you always hear sort of stories about Marlon Brando especially in his later years how he can be sort of difficult to work with and and you know all the sort of legendary stories and the fact like on some movies like he didn't even bother to re remember his lines so he'd have people kind of have an earphone in his ear who would tell him what his lines were or he'd ha have people have cue cards or it's written on the back of things so that he could remember his lines and to kind of hear all that stuff from uh Brando's pers perspective was act was pretty interesting and also, especially in regards of, like, uh, Apocalypse Now, because we always hear the stories behind that and how an interesting story about this one in the doco is, like, you hear from him that when he came onto the project, he thought that the script was kind of a mess. So it was actually him who helped, in his own words, he was the one who helped make the film as good as it was because he helped reshape and rewrite the script. And, of course, um, when all the stories about him from... You know, the producers and director Francis Ford Coppola came out how difficult it was. He kind of felt like he was being thrown under the bus for that and he was being used as a whipping boy. As, you know, a scapegoat, someone to blame. And um, and it's interesting to kind of hear that and also to hear from, you know, sort of the tragic past, his tragic past as well, you know, with his relationship with his father and mother and, you know, it's sort of like his children, especially the sort of tragedies behind some of them. And like I said, it just sort of brings you know, it makes the documentary feel very personal and, and as I say, and as I said earlier, sort of very intimate as a film. Um, 
But at the same time, though, like, you, since you only hear it from sort of, you know, one perspective, it would have it would have been cool. Maybe this is just me because I, I prefer documentaries to have sort of different viewpoints. So the fact that we only hear it from one person instead of other people kind of makes it somewhat one-sided. But I... But at the same time, it kind of works for this documentary. Like I said, it does give a voice to Brando and it gives us his thoughts and feelings on so much stuff. But at the same time, the part of me in the back of my mind would was thinking like, you know, it'd be good if we had, you know, other voices in there as well to see how, how they viewed Marlon as well. And also another thing is like, I know a lot of people are probably going to say, oh, this technique is like revolutionary and amazing. But to be honest though, um... This documentary actually reminded me of a documentary I saw many years ago, and I don't know if many of you saw it. It's called uh, Tupac Resurrection. It was actually nominated for an Oscar for Best Documentary, and it actually used the same kind of technique as this film does by you. And it's uh, basically using the help of archival recordings. We kind of hear the story of Tupac Shakur's life uh, from his own words and how they sort of structured the documentary from the very beginning right up to his death. And we only, and he's our only sort of in it voice in that documentary. So at the set, so in that regard, that's why it kind of. I actually thought Tupac Resurrection was a great movie, so that's probably why I don't think, like, even though I really like Listen to Me, Marlon, I don't think it's quite as good as that film. In fact, you know, it, it, Tupac Resurrection used that technique first, uh, makes it. And this, and so when it was reused, that technique was reused here for this one, it didn't feel as fresh. But at the same time, though, it's still a pretty solid documentary that gives us an insight into my Mar actor Marlon Brando than I think any other sort of documentaries probably would have in the past. And, uh, and I would definitely say if you're a big fan of Marlon Brando, definitely check this one out. It's a really good documentary. That's, I'd say it's worth, a, worth watching. Um, if I had to give this one a rating, um, I'd give it about three and a half stars. Uh, now on to the next film, which of course is the horror thriller, The Invitation. Now I must say beforehand, before I read the synopsis, um, I didn't read uh, the plot to this one. I only heard like, you know, good word from mouth from a lot of people. So I, I kind of deliberately decided not to read about it. And I'd say... The film works best if you don't know too much about it. So if you don't want to hear the synopsis for this film, uh, just sort of skip over about probably about 15 seconds of the video, starting from... Now, Will and Kira are on their way to a house of Will's exes, uh, Eden, for a dinner party. It's the first... Sorry, I'll start that again. Uh, Will and Kira are on their way to the house of Will's ex, Eden, for a dinner party. It's the first time they've seen each other since the death of their young son tore their relationship apart. Will is on the edge from the get-go, convinced that Eden and her strangely smiling friends are up to something sinister, but the line between paranoia and grief is a narrow one, and dangerous for those who walk it. Um, like I said, I didn't really sort of... I heard a lot of great word of mouth on this one, and... They, and especially, I think, from a couple of film festivals in the past, um, and especially from people I know who have seen it, saying that's a, actually a surprisingly great doc horror film. And I thought, okay, I'm not going to... That's all I need to know. I don't need to know what it's... A, and plus, they also said it's one of those ones that's best not knowing too much about. So I thought, okay, not going to read up anything about it. I'm just going to go straight into it, basically blind, and see what it's like. And... I have to say, though, I thought this was a really good film. I really enjoyed this one a lot. And one of the things I really... And this film was uh, directed by uh, Karen Kusuma. Now, if you don't know who she is, she was the director behind the film Girl Fight, which starred Michelle Rodriguez. But she's probably a bit less best known. I'm also known for uh, her follow-up films, which unfortunately weren't quite as good as that one. And those were uh, Eon Flux with Charlize Theron and uh, Jennifer's Body with... Um, Megan Fox. So this is her follow-up film to that one, I believe. So I could be wrong about that. So, and I would have to say this is her back in fine form. This is definitely her best film since Girl Fight. And it's actually on its own. It's a really good film. And I, one that, what I really liked about this one, it's that it's extremely well written. Like, you, yeah, you can kind of see where, as the story kind of goes along, you can kind of see, have an idea 
and kind of know where the story's going to go, but you're at the same time, you're kind of wondering how it's going to get there. And the film does that really well. And, and what I really like is that it's the film kind of has a mixture of sort of of really dark humor. And, and it's actually quite a funny film for the first two halves. But at the same time, though, it, it's a film that kind of ratches up the tension as it goes along and it gets builds and builds and builds until it gets to the third act where it just goes completely insane. And I'm not going to say what happens, though, because, like I said, it's best not to know too much about it. Um, but that's what I really liked about it. Like, I was, like, laughing and at the same time kind of on the edge of my seat as well. And it helps that the script of this film is pretty clever. Like, yeah, like I said, it can be a little pre predictable in parts, but at the same time, though, what I really liked about it is, like, it doesn't fall to the cliches that, and tropes that you would expect of a horror film. Like, there'll be moments where you think, oh, this thing's going to happen, but then all of a sudden it doesn't happen at all. And it happens a few times. And I like that it kind of takes, doesn't go, in in a way, it kind of spins the horror movie on its head in a way. Mainly because it doesn't fall back on the kind of cliches and tropes that we're used to in horror films, which actually made it really refreshing as a film. And also I think because it, it was trying to play it more as a realistic kind of film as well. So hence why, you know, thing like all those cliches don't happen that much. But at the same time, though, it's a film that has a, a lot of interesting and engaging characters in it. And it gives a lot of the actors in the film a lot to work with. Like, it's got a few names in it. Uh, probably not huge names, but ones you would probably recognise when you watch it. Like uh, Logan Marshall Green from uh, Devil and Prometheus. Um, Mikhail Hussman, I, I think that's how you pronounce his name, so I might be doing it wrong. He's probably best known as playing Dario on uh, Game of Thrones. Oh, sorry, Game of Thrones, and as well as Tammy Blanchard and um, John Carroll Lynch. And everyone in this film, like, the casting is spot on. Like, everyone does a really good job with their performances. And and I, a lot of them sort of had interesting, complex layers to them, particularly um, Logan Marshall Green's character, because he's definitely the most interesting character and the most complex, because as the sort of film goes on, like, when he's around all of these you know, his ex-wife, um, played by Tammy Blanchard and, and all that, he, he starts becoming more suspicious and more paranoid about what's going on. And you, and you, throughout a lot of it, you're kind of wondering whether, like, is he, is something actually going on or is it all just in his head? And I really like that the film kind of plays with that a bit and, and really puts us in the mindset of his character. And he's really great in this film as well. So, uh, it's it really well directed. Uh, Karen Kusama does a great job of her direction. Um, and it's just a really good, really engaging, funny, very intense horror film that I just had a ball with. And it's one that I think a lot of people are going to enjoy as well. Like I said, it does have its predictable moments. As you, as a horror filler, you're going to get that. But I think what makes this one... It, but it's definitely um, a pretty well-crafted one nonetheless and it has a lot of really good aspects to it that make it work uh so yeah uh so um if i had to rate the invitation i mean sorry if i had to give the invitation a rating i'd give it four stars i thought it was really good and it's one that i would definitely recommend uh, horror fans to check out well yep that's the end of my uh uh, 10th edition of my myth video reviews. I hope you guys all enjoyed it and keep a lookout very soon for my 11th edition in which I'll be reviewing the Iranian doco drama uh, Tehran Taxi and as well as the indie drama The End of the Tour. So keep a lookout for that and I'll see you guys all later. See everyone. Bye.